everyone. How's it going? Happy to be here with you all. My name is Haley. I am a Veritas Prep instructor and longtime GMAT enthusiast. And I'm excited to be collaborating today uh, with GMAT Club to talk to you guys about a topic that was actually quite heavily requested for this series. Uh, and we've, we've got it for the very first video of this series. Uh, basically, how we tackle, how we take a look at these assumption questions without necessarily inherently having to negate them. And this becomes really valuable to keep in mind because in some cases, uh, the negation technique is just flat out not gonna be the most uh, effective route, right? In theory it works, but when we have kind of negation on negation or when it becomes unclear what element of the answer choice it is we're trying to negate, then it becomes a little more challenging along the way. Now, we are uh, streaming this live, so by all means, jump in and let us know uh, where you're tuning in from, and we'll try to get conversation going as we move through. Again, this is the first video of the series, uh, so bear with us as we're figuring everything out on the technology end of things. Uh, and by all means, jump in with questions as you have them. Alrighty, let's go ahead and kind of dive on in. And I'd like to start by going ahead and addressing uh, the specifics around what we look for out of an argument. So we're gonna start with the basics and then we'll expand out and look at things uh, in the context of. Uh, so uh, yeah, we've got, we've got several instructors that jump in and, and teach through these sessions. So Brian is happily tuning into this one, but, uh, but as an observer today. So let's go ahead and look at things in the context of a quick argument. Thanks for tuning in, guys, awesome. So I have a clearly pretty simplified argument here that says Bill received the greatest number of votes in the school election, so he will become the new president of the student council, right? And on face value, pretty simple, pretty straightforward argument. But we want to make sure that we understand how to contextualize this argument and first and foremost, identify and separate our conclusion language from our premise or evidence. So does anyone want to jump in and let me know the conclusion of this argument? If we're looking out for that conclusion, we have Bill received the greatest number of votes in the school election, so he will become the new president of the student council. Well, we've got some pretty good indicative language that lets us know which element here is our conclusion, right? So he will become the pres new president of the student council, right? So with that in mind, we can recognize that our conclusion here is built off of the premise, Bill received the greatest number of votes in the school election. So yeah, that's exactly right. Now from here, if we want to think about how to attack assumptions without necessarily having to utilize that negation technique, we want to look to see if we can identify the gap that exists between the evidence or premise we have here and the conclusion we're drawing on the basis of that premise. So if that's what we're looking to accomplish here, let's think about, seems like a pretty tight knit argument here, but if we tried to make a case, if we tried to pick holes in this argument, if we tried to pull this argument apart, can anyone think of anything that is being assumed as true or anything that is potentially flawed about this argument? Because if you can identify a gap, you can almost certainly tie it back to a potentially flawed assumption. Good, yeah, that's exactly right. Is the greatest number enough to merit becoming the president, right? Is, there, is this system built in such a way that the highest number of votes equals the winner, right? So highest votes. Do we know that equals winner? So somewhere along the way here, we have an assumption, right, that the highest number of votes equates to the winner. And yes, I love that. Did he even run for president? What if he ran for secretary, for vice president, right? For treasurer. There are many cases here wherein, all right, well, if he didn't even run for president, this is a potentially flawed argument. So again, the assumption here is he did not run for any office other than president. President was the single role that he was, that he was running for. And so when we think about, and again, fairly simplified argument, we're gonna look at this in the context of some challenging GMAT questions. But if we simplify this down and we can identify our conclusion, either by conclusion language, so, thus, therefore, it being adjacent to premise language, right? Letting us know that because or since a particular cause or premise, we can draw a particular conclusion, or by thinking about 
the why behind the conclusion we've drawn. Well, why will he become the new president of the student council? Because he received the greatest number of votes. If we can correctly identify the conclusion and the connection between evidence and conclusion, then we can look for flaws or gaps in logic. And those gaps in logic are where we effectively pre-think and preempt assumptions. So I'd like to go ahead and look at this in the context of a full-fledged example. And I'm going to let you guys lead the way on this example. So we're going to take two minutes and I'm going to let you guys go ahead and dive in to one of my all-time favorite official questions. So I'm going to step off screen and give two minutes on the clock for you guys to go ahead and think through this, this example. Now don't toss your answers into the chat function. I don't want to give it away for everyone. So if you're tuning in live, uh, I'm going to present a link for you guys if you'd like to go ahead and insert your answer into the poll so we can get a sense of where everyone's coming from. And then I will regroup back on stage in two minutes and we're going to chat through some of the specifics around this question. So go ahead, take two, see if you can reason through identifying the conclusion, identifying the immediate premise or piece of evidence used to draw that conclusion, and seeing if you can identify that gap and the underlying assumption behind the gap. All right, you guys have a couple more moments to go here. I am going to hop really quickly back up onto the board uh, just to go ahead. Uh, the, the link, the link in, in YouTube isn't allowing me to put this up, but I'd love to be able to get us through uh, and get us kind of collaborating on the spread that we have, the distribution among our answers. So go ahead and check out uh, pollev.com slash H Cusimano, I know I've got a funky last name, with three zeros. And let me know where you're at in the poll so that we're not giving things away in the chat function just yet and we have the opportunity to roll through everything together. So I'm gonna give you guys another 30 seconds to get on board. And again, pair with us, it's the first time with this particular system. And then we're gonna circle back through together. <laughs> 
let's go ahead and hop back on screen and thanks so much for bearing with me on the tech front guys let's go ahead and run through it together so First and foremost, it looks like we've got our results coming in in the polls, just so we can get a sense for the distribution and where everyone's coming from here. Looks like we've got a pretty heavy collection around, both answer choice A and answer choice E, and that's not unusual. One of them is our correct answer, and the other is our most convincing wrong answer. And we're gonna make sure that we take a moment to really differentiate between the two and understand why. And most of that comes down to, at its core, what an assumption is and what an assumption isn't. So some of you have already started to jump in and, and give us a sense of this argument. So let's go ahead and do so together. We have here, which of the following is an assumption on which the argument depends? As always, we want to start with that question stem so that we've identified our task, kind of the lens or the framework within which we want to go ahead and address this argument. So we're going to take this first one step by step to make sure everyone's caught up on speed. The conclusion of this argument, anyone want to jump in and help me out here with the conclusion of this argument? So, many gardeners believe that the variety of clematis vine that is most popular among gardeners in North America is Jack Monty. This belief is apparently correct since, we've got some indicative language here, of the one million clematis plants sold per year by the largest clematis nursery in North America, 10% are Jack Monty. So, at this point, we know that our conclusion is, yes, this belief is apparently correct. Exactly, right? Jack Monty is, in fact, the most popular variety of clematis. Why? Because in the largest nursery, 10% are Jack Monty. So if we've whittled down, being very careful not to change the meaning along the way, if we've whittled down on our argument into, because in the largest nursery, 10% are Jack Monty, Jack Monty must be the most popular variety. In your own words, can anyone jump into the chat with anything that they have assumed is true? Any, any jump that they've made when moving from because in the largest nursery 10% are Jack Monty, Jack Monty must be the most popular. Not an answer choice, just in your own words, what have they assumed is the case when moving from that evidence to that conclusion? Anyone have thoughts for me here? Because there's something very specific so we have some thoughts on the answer, but in your own words, if we had to try to preempt or pre-think this answer before even moving to the answer choices, is there a particular direction we might be thinking? So popularity is based on sales. I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the proportion, all right. So there's something very specific that I'm hoping really jumps off the screen at you guys with this question. So most of the nurseries show a similar behavior. Certainly there is some as assumption associated with what is true of the sample is true of the population. But we want to be careful because that's different than saying what is true of the sample is true of every other sample. And we're going to want to be on the lookout for that. Yes, so we have an assumption here that 10% is more than any other variety. That 10% is the highest percent, right? That would have to be true in order for it to make sense to say, because 10% are Jack Monty, Jack Monty must be the most popular variety. So in some regard, there's a really good chance that if we look to our answer choices, we're gonna see an answer choice that carries the meaning associated with 10% is the highest percent. So if we can start to think, uh, and we can start to, thank you so much guys, we can start to think through the answer choice that aligns with this gap that 10% must then be the highest percent, we're probably well on our way. And I'd like to start by addressing some of these convincing wrong answers first. Answer choice E is not our correct answer, despite the fact that in many cases, it is chosen about at par with answer choice A, our correct answer. But let's talk about why. So for all nurseries in North America that specialize in clematis, at least 10% of the clematis plants they sell are Jack Monty. For all nurseries, right? So if we've got this for all nurseries, ooh, sorry guys, my technology's uh, tripping up on me. If we have this for all nurseries, well, certainly we would know, need to know that what is true of the sample must also be true of the population, right? But that doesn't inherently mean that what is true of the sample must be true of every other sample. And this is a difference that the GMAT likes to play on its test takers. So we want to make sure we're on the lookout there to recognize that certainly we could still have some, uh, some small nursery in the middle of nowhere in North America that doesn't sell any Jack Monty, and Jack Monty could still be our most popular variety. So while the negation technique in its full form hasn't been applied here, 
right? We can think about, we can double check our answers to this idea of, well, does it have to be true for the argument to make sense? And if it doesn't have to be true for the argument to make sense, it's not our answer, right? So as we move back through, once again, uh, most North American gardeners grow cl clematis in their gardens. Certainly doesn't have to be true for the argument to make sense. That some of the Jack Monty is sold to gardeners outside of North America absolutely doesn't have to make sense, right? And that the largest cl uh, clematis nursery in North America sells nothing but clematis plants certainly doesn't have to be true here. However, let's talk about answer choice A because many of you alluded to this, right? In answer choice A, the nursery sells more than 10 different varieties of clematis. If the nursery did not sell more than 10 different varieties of clematis, and I know we're inching in on the negation technique here, but is there any way that 10% could conceivably be the highest percent? No. We have to know that this is true, and despite the fact that the wording was pretty drastically different, the meaning it carried was the same, right? That 10% at least has the opportunity to be the highest percent. Now, a question I often get with this particular example is, well, yeah, but couldn't a different variety still be more than 10% even if this were true? And yes, it could. It absolutely 100% certainly could. However, that's not what we look for out of an assumption. An assumption is something that must be true for the argument to have the potential to make sense, right? not something that guarantees the truth of the argument. All right, let's circle back to E, because E is certainly our most convincing wrong answer, but let's talk about why E is not our correct answer, right? For all nurseries in North America that specialize in clematis, at least 10% of the clematis plants they sell are Jack Monty. Would this have to be true for our argument to make sense? It certainly seems as though it strengthens a component of the argument, though not the connection between evidence and conclusion, but does it have to be true for our argument to make sense? Does it bridge the gap we're looking for here? No, it could certainly be false. We could certainly be in a position to where not every other nursery follows suit and it's still the most popular variety. So keep in mind when we talk precision and language, when we talk the detail and the specific terminology that's being used, saying something like for all nurseries in North America that specialize in clematis, at least 10% of the clematis plants they sell are Jack Monty is different from saying that if we collected the entire population of nurseries in North America, that's the outcome we would expect. There's a difference between saying that what's true of one sample is true of the population and saying that what is true of a sample is true of every other sample. And even still at that point, it doesn't address the idea that 10% isn't on its own all that notable a percent depending upon the number of varieties at hand. So this hinging piece of information, the gap in logic that exists in this argument and that we need to address using our assumption is that 10% on its own, a percent, a numeric concept on its own without anything to refer back to or anything to compare it to isn't particularly meaningful to us. We need to be able to tie it back to the relevant elements that, that, it, that it corresponds to. Absolutely, yeah. So with that in mind, only answer choice A addresses the connection between premise and conclusion. Because 10% are Jack Monty, Jack Monty must be the most popular variety, and it's the only answer choice that must be true in order for the argument to have the potential to make sense. So we'll want to keep that in mind. So may I know the difficulty level? Ah, so I will say, in general, as you're moving through material, it's not particularly beneficial to hyper-focus on the difficulty level. This is, I believe, a 650 to 700 level question uh, according to GMAT Club standards. Yeah, so this is, a, I believe, a six, uh, roughly 650 level question, as, uh, as will be most of the questions that we move through will be 650 to 700 level questions for those of you who are curious. So again, we identify the conclusion. We identify the primary premise or evidence behind that conclusion, and we think about, well, where's the gap? And when we have a gap in logic, when we have a flaw in logic, we can universally tie that flaw in logic back to a potentially flawed assumption. Yeah. So yeah, we, we have an assumption here that in some regard, 10% corresponds to the highest percent. Now, 
I want to tie back to a bigger picture kind of point that I mentioned along the way here, which is that assumptions must be true in order for the argument to have the potential to make sense. Assumptions do not guarantee the validity of the argument. Notice with our correct answer, we could still be in a position where there's a different percent that's higher. It doesn't guarantee the truth of the argument, but what it does is it bridges the gap between something the author has assumed is true when moving from that premise to that conclusion. And we're gonna talk more about that in the context of a few additional examples right now. Now, in many cases, the assumption may not jump right out at you. It may not scream right off the page in the way that it may have for some of you in that past example. So I want us to look at an example in which for many of my students, the assumption, the relevant assumption or the relevant gap doesn't necessarily jump right off the page at them, but the same strategies can be applied. And I also want to circle us back to a topic that I didn't formally address, but many of you guys jumped into the chat with here. Uh, and it is anytime I have numeric concepts in my critical reasoning questions, I want to be skeptical of those numeric concepts, what they mean, and the assumptions I've placed upon them along the way. So with that in mind, I want to go ahead and leave you guys two minutes for this example as well so that we can then circle back and talk through it together. And to briefly speak to the assumption negation technique, because I have a question in the chat there. The assumption negation technique tells us that because the correct answer is one that must be true in order for the argument to make sense, if I take its complement, if I take what it is not, if I take not whatever that answer choice is, and I test whether the argument could still stand, if taking the complement or what is not my answer choice completely breaks down and destroys my argument, then I've found my assumption. So as a for instance, and again, I know we're talking how we can not necessarily have to rely on the negation technique, but for the clarity of those who had questions on it. In an answer choice like answer choice A, if the nursery did not sell more than 10 different varieties of clematis, the nursery sold 10 or fewer varieties of clematis, and 10% were Jack Monty, that leaves us with the remaining 90% that needs to be distributed among the remaining varieties. And if I have nine or fewer remaining varieties, if I do not have more than 10 different varieties, there is no way I can set that up in such a way that 10% is the highest percent. So this has to be true for the argument to make sense, or according to the assumption negation technique standards, if it's false, the argument falls apart. So that's kind of what we're looking for there, but I wanna make sure, I will say, the negation technique is a really great tool to double check and utilize process of elimination. However, you'll wanna make sure you're still rooted in the logic. You're still rooted in the foundations of the connection and gap therein between evidence and conclusion. Sure thing, yeah, happy to circle back to that. So with that in mind, let's look at this in the context of a new example. So I'm gonna give you guys two minutes to take a look at this one on your own. I'm gonna reset the poll, so by all means, feel free to jump in there once again so we can get a sense of, well, how many of us did arrive at the correct answer? What convincing wrong answers swayed us? And then we're gonna regroup and run through some bigger picture takeaways from this example as well. So go ahead, take two.
right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and hop back on screen and we're going to chat about this one again. Um, by all means, wh whether you choose to uh, submit in the poll or not, go ahead and let's hold off on the responses in the chat for the time being. I want to make sure I'm not giving this away for the rest of us. So let's go ahead and run through this. I have the reasoning above assumes which of the following. So once again, we know we're looking at an assumption question. Ah, so this, this question is, uh, is not, is not a, a GMAT prep question. The first one I mentioned was an official question. This one is not. So you'll, you won't run into issues there. There will be one more question uh, that does appear, uh, it'll be the second to last one that does appear uh, in the practice tests. I'll, I'll be sure to give you guys the alert on that one. So yeah, let's talk about it because as you guys mentioned, right, we've got some answers on B, we've got some answers on E. So let's talk about what it is we're trying to break down. First of all, we have some pretty mixed results here. So we're about in, in even cadence with B versus E, right? Although we've got some sprinkled around elsewhere as well. So we're going to talk through each of these answers as we move through. So. If the reasoning above assumes which of the following, we again want to go through the process of identifying conclusion, identifying the primary premise, right, or evidence behind that conclusion, and thinking about where's the gap. So in North America, there's been an explosion of public interest in and enjoyment of opera over the last three decades. The evidence of this explosion is that of the 70 or so professional opera companies currently active in North America, 45 were founded over the course of the last 30 years. So if we're saying because 45 of our 70 were founded over the last 30 years, clearly there's been an explosion of interest. And again, this one may not jump out as you, at you as clearly as the last one did. but. In our own words, if we were trying to develop out the gap in reasoning, the flaw in logic between premise and conclusion, can anyone give me a sense of what that might be? And again, we've got a lot of folks on the right track in terms of the answers. And yes, for those of you who are jumping in, B is our correct answer here, but let's go ahead and talk through it. So in many ways, students will struggle with this particular template of question. And I will say, you could expect to see additional questions that follow pretty precisely this exact template right? But with different content tossed in along the way. So at this point, it's really easy to read through this argument and assume, okay, well, if 45 out of 70 were founded over the course of the last 30 years, then we started with 25, we added 45, and we got to 70, right? Well, not necessarily, right? So if we're looking at this argument, we could be in a position to where maybe we started with 100, 45 of them, or uh, 75 of them closed down and 45 opened up. And yeah, we arrived at 70, but that doesn't inherently tell us that we've had an increase. So the assumption here in our own terms is that 45 being founded constitutes an increase, right? That would have to be true in order for it to make sense to move from the evidence we've listed to the conclusion we've drawn on its basis. So yes, there could have been companies that shut down in the last 30 years, and we haven't accounted for that in the data above. So that's built into our assumption. So I wanna start again by talking through some of our convincing wrong answers here. And again, I'm gonna contextualize it with my kind of one-off version of what would otherwise be considered the negation technique. And that is that we can absolutely always test our answer choices to the question, does it have to be true? for the argument to make sense. If we can make a case for where it doesn't have to be true for the argument to be valid, it is not an assumption. So I want to start with E because E very consistently tends to be the most frequently chosen wrong answer. The 45 most recently founded companies were all established as a result of enthusiasm on the part of a potential audience. Well, does this have to be true in order for our argument to be valid? Certainly not. I could have a couple of these that were built for philanthropic reasons, or maybe because some billionaire just really likes opera. And that tells me that, well, certainly there could still have been an explosion in interest. This doesn't have to be true for my argument to make sense, and thus is not an assumption. So you'll want to make sure that as you address assumption questions, you really start to differentiate between elements that strengthen our argument, certainly, right? Add validity or seem relevant or seem on topic, but don't have to be true in order for the argument to make sense because that's the differentiating element that makes or breaks an, an assumption. And along the same lines, 
Answer choice A can be eliminated for much the same reason. All of the 70 professional opera companies are commercially viable. We don't need to know that. We could have had an explosion of public interest, even if some of those, again, were built for alternate reasons. Now, the last convincing wrong answer choice that I see here is answer choice D. The size of the average audience at performances by professional opera companies has increased over the past three decades. And once again, again, we want to take the time to front load our time on the analysis to think about how we might take the direction of that gap in logic, that flaw in logic, and develop out an assumption on its basis, but we can also use process of elimination to find the answer choices that don't have to be true for the argument to make sense, right? So with this in mind, yeah, there we go, millionaire could be that potential audience. We're gonna talk about B in just a moment, so circle back with me then. With answer choice D, the size of the average audience at performances by professional opera companies has increased, well, this certainly doesn't have to be true. We could be in a position to where if there are abundantly more operas showing abundantly more opera performances, then even if the size of the average audience has stayed the same, or even if it's decreased, we could still have a net increase in public interest as a whole. So certainly answer choice D is out on that means. And whether or not we've had an increase in professional companies devoted to other performing arts is pretty irrelevant to us here, right? So let's talk about why B fits the, fits the bill for what an assumption is. So answer choice B is admittedly worded a little confusingly, and that's by design. There were fewer than 45 professional opera companies that had been active 30 years ago and that ceased operations during the last 30 years. This answer choice B is telling me fewer than 45 opera companies disbanded during this time. So do we need to know that fewer than 45 professional opera companies disbanded in order to say, because 45 were founded, we've seen an increase, an explosion of public interest? Well, certainly, right? Again, we're steering away, we're steering into alternate approaches, but if we did think about how that negation technique applies, if we're tying this to the negation technique, well, if we were in a position to where more than 45 opera companies or 45 or more opera companies that had been active 30 years ago just disbanded, well then we can't use 45 were founded to constitute an increase. We may very well still have a net loss. So answer choice B must be true for the argument to make sense. And I will say, this is a very common kind of template or structure that you could expect to see on this question type, wherein they've baited us into assuming certain things about the numeric concepts at hand. It's easy to read the numeric concepts at face value and say, all right, well, if we have 45 founded over the course of the last 30 years and we make it to 70, we started with 25, we add 45, we get to 70. But we don't have that knowledge. That's just not necessarily the case. So we wanna make sure along the way that we're being very careful to look out for the assumptions that you are placing, right? The outside context that you are bringing into the argument, especially when it comes down to those numeric concepts. Because numeric values will absolutely make or break how you address critical reasoning questions and they are a somewhat increasing trend on critical reasoning questions because they task us to bridge the gap between the way that we logically intuit and move through mathematic concepts and how that happens when there are words jumbled into the mix. Yeah, this is, I, I will say this is another one of my absolute favorite questions and it's a structure you could expect to see a whole lot of because again, it baits us into placing our own assumptions on the numeric concepts that just flat out don't exist, don't have to be true, but tie us back to the author's intended assumption at hand. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at example three. Because once again, I wanna think about where we can start to draw conclusions and how we can identify the conclusion, the relevant premise or premises, and the connection or lack thereof, the gap between the two. Because once again, if we can identify the gap, we can in many cases preempt or prethink the direction that that gap takes. So that even if the wording's a little different among our answer choices, the meaning that it carries should be the same. So once again, I'm gonna give you guys two minutes to take a look at this one on your own, whether you're listening in live or tuning in after the fact. Uh, please, 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 if you're gonna give your responses, go ahead and do so in the polls so we're keeping things somewhat secretive on the chat front for those who are working through the question uh, and so that we can get some cumulative results from you guys. So go ahead, 
Take two, and then we're gonna regroup and chat about this one together. All right, all right, let me go ahead and jump back on screen. It uh, looks like for a couple of you that had a little bit of trouble if you've got some uh, screen re resolution difficulties, uh, I tried to go ahead and toss a link in, but unfortunately it's not a capability they're letting me roll with. So let's go ahead and just run through this one together. And once again, I wanna start by seeing where we fell in the polls. And once again, we're in a position where we've got some disagreement, we've got some dispersion, however, we have a couple more folks that have aligned onto our correct answer in this case. So let's go ahead and talk through it. So again, we're looking at an assumption question and yeah, universally over the course of today, that's what we're gonna be taking a look at. However, we wanna see if we can identify our conclusion, our premise, and the gap that exists between the two. So at this point, if criminals released from prison on parole have generally been put under routine supervision and a recent program has allowed them to leave early under intensive supervision, they must obey curfews, in some cases be electronically monitored, and the percentage of released criminals arrested while under supervision is the same, so emphasis on percentage, uh, as for routine supervision, so intensive supervision is no more effective than routine supervision in preventing criminals from committing additional crimes. So, pretty clearly here, if we're looking out for our conclusion language, we've found it here at the end of our argument, right? So intensive supervision is no more effective than routine supervision in preventing criminals from uh, committing additional crimes. Now, the evidence or premise listed therein is that they were, the percentage of released criminals were the same across the board for Intensive versus for routine, right? So yeah, anytime that I've got that so, that's again, so, thus, therefore, right? Hence, I've got a pretty good indication of what my conclusion is. Again, we can utilize conclusion language. We can look out for its adjacency to premise language. We can make sure that it has a why or an explanation listed behind it. And anytime we have some sort of call to action, we can also identify that we're looking at a conclusion. But now, let's talk a little bit, let's look a little bit into the gap that exists between the percentage of released criminals arrested while under supervision is the same, therefore, intensive supervision is no more effective in preventing committing additional crimes. Anyone wanna talk to me about the gap that exists there? Can anyone key in for me 
on a gap in logic. So we need to bolster the conclusion a little more specifically than that. So if we're trying to dig into the gap in logic, and in this case, the gap in language is gonna be the key. Between the percentage of released criminals arrested was the same, so intensive supervision is no more effective. So this is interesting, equating numbers to percentages. Normally, that's something we absolutely wanna be on the lookout for, right? Normally, that's absolutely something we wanna see, but keep in mind, it's already listed this information in terms of percentages, right? So if it's already given us things in terms of percentages, we already have the relevant measurement that associates with the effectiveness within that group. However, and who was it that jumped in with this? Yeah, so arrests versus additional crimes. We want to keep in mind in our premise here, we've spoken to arrested, the percentage of released criminals arrested while under supervision was the same. And then on that basis, we've concluded that intensive supervision is no more effective than routine in preventing them from committing additional crimes. Now, being arrested for crimes is certainly, or at least could be, a completely different metric than committing additional crimes, particularly because we're intensely supervising these folks. If I'm looking for the gap in logic, that what jumps off the page to me on this one is that, hey, if we're supervising people very closely, if we're electronically monitoring them, if we're giving them curfews, aren't we just more likely to catch them if they commit a crime, right? So if that's the case, that pretty quickly keys me in on the potentially flawed assumption inherent in this argument. And again, I know many of you guys chose answer choice E. I know many of you identified, or in this case, misidentified, right? An assumption that seems to very closely align with answer choice E. So let's talk about it before we move into why our correct answer is in fact correct. We have the number of criminals put under routine supervision was not significantly greater than the number of criminals put under intensive supervision. So yeah, so we're already looking at a percentage or a proportion, that's exactly correct. And that's going to be the most relevant measurement to us here. We don't have to know that the number of criminals put under routine supervision versus uh, intensive supervision was greater than, less than, anywhere along the way. The number we have in, in, the, in each group doesn't matter to us so long as we've already expressed things in terms of this percent or proportion. So while I love the direction you guys are taking this because it's a very usual case for where we could run into trouble on critical reasoning questions, in this case, we already have the data presented to us in the most ideal fashion and we don't have to know that the groups are of the same size in order for this argument to make sense or in order for it not to. Right? So again, could be true, could be false, doesn't really impact our argument, which means it's not an assumption. And again, if we look to some of these other uh, wrong answers that far fewer of you chose, uh, of the criminals arrested while under intensive, some wouldn't have committed if they had been under routine. Yeah, that doesn't particularly matter to me here. Again, could be true, could be false, doesn't really matter. The criminals under intensive, but not those under routine were required to work. Well, certainly whether or not they were required to work or attend school is pretty irrelevant to us here. And whether all of the criminals, oop, whether all of the criminals who were arrested while under routine had been in prison more than once beforehand certainly doesn't have to be true for the argument to make sense. However, as you guys are all mentioning now in the chat, according to answer choice C, the proportion of arrests to crimes committed was not significantly higher for criminals under intensive than those under routine. This absolutely must be true in order for our argument to be valid, right? We are assuming along the way that these criminals weren't just more likely to be caught because we were supervising them more closely. So we wanna be really careful to make sure in cases like this one, because again, it's another very common structure to where the content may be mixed in a little differently, but the trap answer and the structure is roughly the same. We'll wanna look out for cases to where it seems as though the argument makes a lot of sense because it almost seems like they've repeated the same thing twice when moving from premise to conclusion. But we'll wanna be really, really careful because when they've changed the language used along the way, 
it's almost certainly trying to indicate something to us. It's not on accident. When they've moved from criminals arrested to criminals committing additional crimes, we want to look out for that. Anytime that they've conflated two elements as the same in meaning when, gosh, they're not necessarily, they don't have to be the same in meaning. And certainly in many cases, we have good reason to believe on the basis of this context that they might not be. Then we want to take a step back and again, make sure that we are not falling under, we are not falling prey to the assumption inherent in this argument. All right. Very nicely done, guys. Jump in if you have questions for me on this one, but a couple of the big, big takeaways that we'll want to keep in mind on this particular example. When two elements are basically conflated, when they're posed as equal, we want to look out for possible subtle differences in meaning, because that's almost certainly what the potentially flawed assumption inherent in the argument will key in on. And with that in mind, I will say, you've noticed that I've, when I've moved through these questions, in many cases, I've kind of whittled down the language into a more simplified structure so that I'm not getting distracted by the context, so that I'm not getting distracted by the extra wording that didn't necessarily need to be there. However, we want to be very, very careful when we do so. That when we paraphrase, we do not veer away from the original meaning of the argument. We have to maintain, we have to retain that original meaning. Otherwise, we'll run into issues to where in question structures like this one, we miss the difference or potential difference between criminals arrested and crimes committed. So I want to be very, very careful in this case to make sure that if you paraphrase, paraphrase, if you whittle down into its most simple terms, that you're making sure that you hold the original meaning as you move through. All right, very nicely done, guys. Thank you for being so active in the chat. Let's go ahead and look at another example. And in this one, again, we're asked for the assumption on which the argument depends. And once again, I want to see if you guys can identify conclusion, premise, and the gap that exists between the two. Because if we can identify the gap and we can get a sense for what direction that gap takes us, in many ways, we can preempt the meaning among the answer choices. And then rather than trying to puzzle each answer choice back into the stimulus or back into the question stem, we can identify the correct answer choice according to its intended meaning. So go ahead, take two once again. Uh, if you don't mind, toss those answers in the poll so we can get a cumulative understanding of where you guys are at and then we'll chat through this one together.
All right, everyone, let's go ahead and circle back and talk a little bit about this one together. So again, we're looking for which one of the following is an assumption on which the argument depends. And we've got a lot of folks on a very similar track here, but still a little disagreement along the way. So I wanna make sure we're feeling comfortable with where we're at on this one. Let's go ahead and dig in. So in the past, every 10 percentage point increase in cigarette prices uh, has decreased per capita sales of cigarettes by 4%. And now, this country is about to raise taxes on cigarettes by nine cents per pack, right? And the average, uh, the average price of cigarettes is and has been for more than a year, 90 cents per pack. So we know that this nine cents increase in taxes corresponds to 10% of the overall cost per pack. So the tax hike stands an excellent chance of reducing per capita sales of cigarettes by 4%. So once again, we're in a position where we have this term so indicating to us our conclusion language, right? So the tax hike stands an excellent chance of reducing per capita sales of cigarettes by 4%. So if we are saying that ta the tax hike stands an excellent chance of reducing per capita sales by 4%, why? Because uh, they are about to raise taxes by nine cents, which corresponds to 10%. And historically, this 10% change has merited that outcome. Let me ask you guys once again, where's the gap? What's the gap in reasoning here? Oh, yeah, I love the, I love the, uh, the relation that we have here to other real life examples. That's exactly right. So where's the gap in reasoning? Because it's a very similar gap to the one that we, we spoke about in the, in the last example. We're saying raise taxes by nine cents per pack. So the tax hike stands an excellent chance of reducing sales by 4%. Absolutely, yeah, it's assuming in some capacity that the manufacturers, that the sellers are passing on the increase to consumers, right? We've conflated a 10% increase in taxes to a 10% increase in cost, right? Once again, we're conflating two things that are not necessarily equal in nature. And when we've done that, we wanna take a step back and look out for how that might be untrue, right? The gap in reasoning there. And as many of you guys noted, again, this would be a challenging one to kind of preempt or prethink to the, to the fullest degree. But if we were on the lookout for the fact that there is a potential gap in the taxes applied versus the cost to consumers, we can pretty quickly see here that A addresses that gap. Tobacco companies are unlikely to reduce their profit per pack of cigarettes to avoid an increase in the cost per pack to consumers, right? So this is telling me that, hey, when we raise taxes by nine cents, that's gonna be reflected into these consumers who will thus be expected to reduce their sales by 4%. And it is the only answer among these answer choices that must be true in order for the argument to make sense, that must be true in order to logically move from the evidence that's been cited to the conclusion we're drawing on the basis of that evidence. That's exactly right. Yeah, so with that in mind, we did have a couple of folks uh, on other ends of the spectrum here, so let's take a moment and talk about it. So previous increases have generally been due to increases in taxes. Well, this certainly doesn't have to be true for the argument to make sense. And while you could maybe make a case for how it loosely strengthens in what might have been a strengthened question, it is certainly not into terms with what we expect out of an assumption. It does not have to be true in order for the argument to make sense. Whether or not those previous increases were due to taxes or any of a number of different elements doesn't impact whether it's likely to lead to this 4% decrease now. And again, any decrease in per capita sales of cigarettes will result mainly from an increase in people who quit smoking entirely. Whether it's people who quit smoking entirely or whether the average person just, con just reduces their consumption makes absolutely no difference here right? Makes absolutely no difference in how we're moving through. And yeah, a couple of these inch in the direction of some common trap answer types we'll want to be on the lookout for because we're looking at things that may seem relevant, that may sound on topic, but don't have to be true for the argument to make sense. And once again, C does not comply with this have to be true. 
On, and again, if we speak to D, if we speak to answer choice E, whether at present the price of a pack of cigarettes includes taxes that amount to less than 10% of the total selling price, completely irrelevant, does not address this gap between, well, we've talked about raising taxes, but that doesn't necessarily compare with what we're doing when we raise prices, right? That's, one does not necessarily imply the other. And nor does what we have in answer choice E, the number of people in Cabonia who smoke cigarettes has remained relatively constant for the past several years. Once again, we've spoken about this idea that how this distribution comes into play doesn't matter to us because we're looking at how it compares to a total sales. Right? So whether it's that the number of people has increased or decreased or the consumption per capita per person has increased or decreased makes no difference to us here. It may sound relevant to the topic, but it is certainly out of scope because it doesn't address the apparent gap between a tax raise and a corresponding decrease in sales of cigarettes resulting from an increase in cost. So we need something that lets us know this increase in taxes equates to an increase in cost. Awesome, very nicely done. Thanks once again for jumping into the chat there for me. But once again, a couple of big picture takeaways that I wanna make sure we're gathering from that example. Before I steal, I know a couple more minutes of your time than I think was promised in this webinar, uh, but I have one more example for you guys and it's a good one. So please, 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 if you can stick around for it. We wanna look out for generalizations where we're saying, well, because this always happened in the past, we're gonna expect it to happen now. And we wanna look out for the precision in language inherent in that generalization. Well, does it really mean the same thing if we're saying taxes increase and all of the premise that we have around this corresponded to an increase in sales? We wanna be wary of that. We wanna be suspicious. We wanna be critical, right? It's critical reasoning after all. And we wanna look out for those gaps in logic because generally some of these at the above will lead us logically to the gap in logic and thus the potentially flawed assumption behind that gap. So yeah, this last one is a 700 plus level question, but it's a good one. And I will say, uh, for those of you who may happen to be non-native English speakers, it's also a question that happens, that happens to give some of my non-native English speaking students uh, a little bit of frustration early on, depending on how they move through the question. So we we'll wanna make sure, as you guys are moving through, once again, we're looking out for the conclusion. We're looking to understand the relevant premise or premises, and we're identifying the gap between. However, in the same style that we want to make sure we're not becoming overwhelmed with or too engrossed in details, in terminology, and in made up names as they appear in reading comprehension, exactly the same is true when we're looking to critical reasoning. I want you guys to take this two minutes to really focus in on the terminology here that matters without getting too caught up in or overwhelmed by what doesn't. And I'll explain more of what I mean there when we return, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave you guys to it. Take two minutes and then we will return and roll through this one together. <laughs> 
All right, let's go ahead and jump back in. So we've got some pretty mixed responses on this one as well, but it means that it'll leave us to a really great opportunity to uh, go ahead and get a conversation going around this one. So which one of the following is an assumption on which the editor's argument depends? Once again, I wanna get a sense of and make sure everyone sees where we fall in terms of our answers. And I will say accuracy just in the nick of time has swayed in the direction we want it to. So very nicely done, everyone participating live. Let's go ahead and talk about it. So this newspaper editor, a sale, uh, David Salino, a sales is distorted, our quotation of remarks on these values by the prime minister and bemoans what he sees as the likely consequences for relations. So a lot of really dense terminology, a lot of words that you may not be comfortable with, particularly because some of them are made up. Uh, those consequences will not be our fault, however, since officials at the embassy and scholars at the institute have all confirmed that as printed, our quotation was an acceptable translation of the prime minister's remarks. No newspaper can fairly be blamed for the consequences of its reporting when that reporting is accurate. So let me start by asking you guys this. What's our conclusion? All right, we want to start with this process, with this consistent process of identify the conclusion, identify the premise or premises behind that conclusion, and see what gap exists. And certainly, yes, I brought this one up as kind of our capstone question because it is. It's inherently a pretty confusing question, particularly if you're allowing yourself to get caught up in all the language here. Okay, so let's talk about this. I have no newspaper can be fairly blamed, the last sentence. And most students will make this mistake. They'll say, all right, well, the last sentence Seems like it ought to be our conclusion. Uh, generally speaking, the last sentence is where I see my conclusion. And as a quick aside, without trying to get too far off track, I would be very, very careful not to, to have your approach be primarily based in pattern recognition and application. So if you're looking at it and you're saying, well, usually the last sentence is my conclusion, it will catch you off guard in some cases. So make sure logic is the foundation and pattern recognition is secondary here. So. The last sentence that says no newspaper can fairly be blamed for the consequences of its reporting when that reporting is accurate doesn't have a reason cited for it. It doesn't have a why behind it. No evidence is given to support the idea that no newspaper can fairly be blamed for the consequences when that reporting is accurate. That's not our conclusion. It can't be. Our conclusion has to be something that has a why, that has a corresponding premise, or even several corresponding premises. So if no reason is cited for it, it's a premise, it's not a conclusion. So in this case, our conclusion, as you guys mentioned here, is that those consequences will not be our fault. And if you were uncertain that that was our conclusion, I mentioned that there are a couple of major ways we can identify conclusions. We can look out for conclusion language, which we were kind of lacking in this case, we can look for calls to action, right? They should, he will, he needs to, right? We can look for premise language adjacency, right? Is it next to a clear premise, right? There we go, yeah, that's exactly what I'm getting at. And we can also test it by saying, well, have we cited a reason why we have this information? And in this case, those consequences will not be our fault, however, since Officials at the embassy and scholars at the institute have all confirmed that this was an acceptable translation. We have a reason cited for why we're drawing the conclusion that the consequences will not be our fault. So here's where this gets a little tricky. And once again, you'll notice I've keyed in on information in terms like since, like however, right? The conclusion and premise language and how we've recognized it. I've avoided entirely even utilizing all of these funky words and terms that we have at the front end of the, the, the stimulus because we don't need them, right? They're there to distract us, they're there to intimidate us, and they're there to overwhelm us. So we wanna dig into the terminology and the structure to find what matters without getting overwhelmed with what doesn't. So if we whittle this down without changing the meaning, we're saying the consequences will not be our fault, why? Well, because officials at the embassy and scholars at the, at the institute have confirmed that our quotation was an acceptable, hey, was an acceptable translation. No newspaper can be fair, fairly be blamed for the consequences of its reporting when that reporting is accurate. So, at this point, I'm a little suspicious. Why am I a little suspicious? 
on the basis of the couple of past questions we've already done. So no newspaper can be blamed when their reporting is accurate. Officials have quoted that we have an ac acceptable translation, therefore we can't be blamed. Yes, that's exactly right. The argument is once again conflating, right, or posing as equal, that acceptable translation carries the same meaning as accurate reporting. And we know that accurate reporting and accurate translation could be entirely different things, right? So we want to make, be on the lookout for an assumption that addresses the potential difference between accuracy and translation. That's exactly right. And that's all this came down to is once again, we had a structure just like this earlier that you guys for the most part breezed through because it was short, sweet, to the point, and clearly written. We have virtually the same structure that's just been distracted with additional terminology and with names and terms that you may not be familiar with, but the structure is the same. So if we can rely on that structure, we can move through these questions just as efficiently. So with that in mind, we're assuming that accurate translating conflates with is equal to accurate reporting. And what answer choice addresses this? Our accurate translation versus accurate reporting? Well, the confirmation that the translation is acceptable is sufficient to show that the Prime Minister's remarks were accurately reported, right? So answer choice A addresses, fills this gap that tells me, hey, accuracy and, trans and translation don't necessarily mean the same thing. Whereas, if we speak to any of our convincing wrong answers, and let me circle back to it. So the only one that was very primarily chosen here was E. Many of you very much on the right track with this one. But as we move forward, whether or not only scholars or people with official standing can pass judgment doesn't matter to us here. Whether he was prepared to praise the newspaper is certainly out of scope. Uh, if the newspaper's rendering was not distorted, then there's no reason to fear consequences. We're not worried about whether or not we can fear consequences. We're contesting whether or not they're our fault, right, from the perspective of the, the newspaper editor. And that newspapers ought not consider the consequences is also completely irrelevant to the argument at hand. So whether you got there by process of elimination or by identifying, all right, well, here's the one that must be true in order for the argument to make sense, the others don't have to be true. Let's, yeah, let's go ahead and talk back, let's circle back to E. Only scholars or people with official standing are in a position to pass judgment. You actually are one step ahead of me because I was just about to address this point. So whether or not only scholars or people with official standing are in a position to pass judgment doesn't actually matter to us because the fact that they've confirmed that our quotation was an acceptable translation is given to us as premise. It's given to us as fact. And in strengthen, weaken, assumption, evaluate questions, in any of our core question types that all boil back down to assumptions and their potentially flawed nature, we are never trying to strengthen or weaken the premises. The premises are given to us as fact. We're saying if we take this new true piece of information and we align it with the existing true pieces of information, how does it impact our connection between premise and conclusion? And so anytime we're looking into any variety of strength and weaken assumption evaluate question, we are never trying to impact the premises. The premises are already presented to us as fact. And yeah, on that note as well, if we look at this, whether or not only scholars or people with official standing are in this position, if it's not only scholars or people in official standing, that doesn't change the existing gap between acceptable translation and accurate reporting, right? And that's what we're trying to address here. So again, it could be true, it could be false, and it doesn't impact the validity of our argument, right? And if it could be true and it could be false and it doesn't distinctly make or break my argument, it's not an assumption. But if you were convinced by it, if you steered in that direction, and if you often struggle with questions like this one, you'll want to be on the lookout to make sure that with strength and weaken assumption and evaluate questions, right, our core question types to where we have our conclusion, our premise, and the connection or gap therein, right, that we can address it without attempting to strengthen or weaken the premise. That's never the task at hand in any of these question types. All right. 
any other lingering questions, anything else that we need to take a moment to chat about on the note of this example. I will say A and E tend to be the only answer choices that are, that are really ever chosen in this case, but with any of our lingering questions we could, or, or answer choices, we could absolutely connect it back to this idea of does it have to be true? for the argument to make sense. If it doesn't have to be true for the argument to make sense, it's not an assumption. And in many cases, we can take a step back and we can look out for the opportunity to where we can identify and preempt that gap before we analyze these answer choices so we're less convinced by the convincing wrong ones. How does, how does option E counter the premise, the last one? So only scholars or people with official standing are in a position to pass judgment. Well. If only scholars or people with an official standing, if this were untrue, right, it might impact our premise in some way. It may tell us, oh, well, we've said that this is, you know, this is the quotation or the citation from these experts, but maybe they're not the only people who are in a position to be experts. It doesn't impact the fact that we've used the evidence that we have an acceptable translation according to whatever source, right, that we have here to draw the conclusion that we have accurate reporting. So in this case, it is that it does not impact that connection, only the strength, so to speak, loosely speaking, of the evidence that's being used. Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, we're never trying to strengthen or weaken the evidence. And in particular, we're never trying to directly impact the evidence on its own. In a, an assumption question, we're looking to address the connection between premise and conclusion. Does it make sense to use that evidence, true as it may be, to draw the conclusion we're drawing? So can we explain why B is wrong? Sure, let's talk about it. So newspapers ought not consider the consequences of their coverage in deciding what to report. So whether or not they should consider the consequences of their coverage is not what's at hand here in this argument. We're saying the consequences will not be our fault. That's what we're concluding. We're not concluding there will or will not be consequences. We're not concluding whether we should or should not be concerned with those consequences. We're concerned with whether or not those consequences will be our fault, right? And yes, somewhere implied in the premises, we have this idea that we have an acceptable translation and that in some regard, that's the job right, of newspapers and newspaper editors. But whether or not this is true does not directly impact my argument. Whether they should consider the consequences or should not consider the consequences does not impact the conclusion those consequences will not be our fault and its connection back to the relevant premise because we've said it's an acceptable translation and we can't be blamed if the reporting is accurate. The, the gap in logic that it exists there is the gap between acceptable translation and accurate reporting. All right, any lingering questions on this one before I wrap things up for our session and go ahead and go through a couple of final points. All right, let's go ahead and go for it. So big thing, big, big takeaway from this question was just boiling down to the terminology that matters without taking a step back and getting too overwhelmed with what doesn't. So focus on the terminology that matters. Focus on indicative language that lets us know I'm looking at a premise. I'm looking at a conclusion, right? And how can I whittle that down without changing the meaning along the way, right? And I love this, Kevin. Yeah, so the more I do it, the more I realize it's just a game. I will tell you, um, I, I scored perfectly on the verbal portion of the test, and it was not because I am particularly great at memorization. I'll tell you, I'm not. It's not something that I've ever been particularly fond of. The reason I scored as well as I did is because I've treated it like a logic game or a puzzle and truly at its roots. And I, I will say it's why I've fallen in love with this test as well, right? It's all about thinking critically, thinking logically, and almost playing a game of chess against the makers of this test and understanding and digging into how they're trying to test us, how they're trying to trap us, and if we're prepared, how we can be a step ahead of that. Yeah, that's absolutely right, yeah. So we wanna be careful that we're not using that to utilize pattern recognition as a primary strategy, but rather so that we can use that to make sure that logic and critical thinking, that higher order thinking, is at the root of how we approach each of these questions. So to really brief, briefly round us back to the couple of big picture takeaways that I've sprinkled in over the course of this past little over an hour. We wanna make sure that to effectively conquer assumption questions, we're able to identify the conclusion, 
and thus the relevant premises, that we can identify the gap where possible. It won't always jump right out at you, but if it does, it puts you in a really good position to find the meaning of the correct answer among the answer choices, rather than trying to match or puzzle each answer choice back into the stimulus. And when we can't, or when we need a secondary approach, boiling down or simplifying this assumption negation technique into, right, well, why does this have to be true for the argument to make sense? If it could be false and the argument could still make sense, then it's not an assumption, right? So we want to identify that gap and we want to look for the meaning of that gap, but not necessarily the exact wording among our answer choices. So with that in mind, I will say, I'm a huge fan of assumption questions because I really do generally feel they build the foundations for how we think about other critical reasoning questions. When we strengthen a question, we are addressing or strengthening a potentially flawed assumption. When we weaken a question, we're exposing that flawed assumption. And when we evaluate a line of reasoning, we're finding the answer choice for which the answer to the question pivotally hinges on that potentially flawed assumption. And when we answer it one way, our assumption is very likely flawed. And when we answer it the other, it's very likely valid. And so building on your understanding of assumptions will absolutely build on your critical reasoning strategy as a whole. So we want to keep that in mind. We want to circle back to it and make sure that you've built the foundations in logic as opposed to that pattern recognition. So with that in mind, thank you so much for joining me uh, today to talk about assumptions, especially since I know I've stolen a little more of your time than I originally promised. And thank you for bearing with us getting up to speed on the technology front. This is the very first video of this series. Uh, so I'm excited to be back uh, to join you guys a little later in the series to talk about some of my other favorite topics. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you guys soon. And in the meantime, happy studying.